Shalom, and welcome back to Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker. We've been talking this morning about being still before the Lord, being quiet before the Lord, and how we filled every waking hour with the noise of this world, with the chatter and the clutter that blocks out the very voice of God. There's so many things that we're afraid of, so many things that we are fearful of, and actually there is a fear of silence, a fear of silence phobia called sedate phobia. Silence, it is said, speaks a thousand words. It's also common knowledge that couples who can spend their time in silence and still feel as if they had the best conversations ever will usually stay together. However, to some people, silence can be downright scary. Scary. There is a term for this phobia, sedatophobia. The word originates from the Greek word sedate, meaning silent or sleeping or even dead, and phobos meaning the Greek god of fear or dread or aversion. The phobia was relatively unheard of 50 years ago. However, today it is a fairly common phobia. Expert psychotherapists are seeing large numbers of sedatophobic individuals in their offices and they believe that these numbers will continue to rise in the coming decades. For sedatophobic individuals, darkness might not be scary, but the silence and lack of noise can bring on a full-blown panic attack. People suffering from sedatophobia cannot withstand silence. They constantly need noise and human interaction. This constant neediness can be very harmful to the individual. There's many causes, just like any other phobia, the fear of silence is usually caused by a traumatic or negative episode in the phobic's life. Some phobics, for example, might have been locked up or abused by an adult. Some having been kept in basements or closets for punishment where no outside sound reaches them. The feelings the child has experienced then can get permanently etched on his or her mind. News of a loved one's death or other traumatic negative episode associated with silence can also bring on this phobia. We know that it's spiritual, but yet in the natural we have experts medicating and prescribing and 50 million Americans taking some kind of sleep aid to help them with the silence. The mind is hard to turn off, but yet this is exactly where God speaks to us. In the still, quiet times, Many experts believe that technology has also given rise to the constant need for sounds around humans. For some people, it's impossible to meditate on God's Word or sit in a quiet room for even a few minutes, as they always need their phone, music, TV, or the noise of traffic around them. Do you recall the inability to keep quiet in the lower grades when teachers would insist upon complete silence? Children especially cannot stay without making noise since they are by nature noisy. They also have more energy, hence whispering is also not really that possible for them. Everything they, ha they do has to be loud and amplified and adults often ask children to keep quiet who often fight, face punishments when they don't. Silence is typically associated with the night can be associated with forest or other uninhabited areas having a complete lack of civilization. To be left in silence can mean being hunted down by supernatural things or things that go bump in the night. It also brings on the fear of the unknown. Most sufferers of sedatophobia also tend to have inherent anxieties. They may inherently be monophobes, the fear of being left alone. The fear of ghosts is also associated with this phobia. Other causes of the fear of silence include adrenal insufficiencies, depression, hormonal imbalances, and delusional paranoia. It's interesting that we have become a culture that is afraid of the silence. Professional speakers use the pause as an emphasis. I remember years ago that I wanted to preach the sermon about Elijah and I wanted to have two minutes of complete silence before the congregation. So I stood there at the pulpit 
and I said nothing. And pretty soon, 10 or 15 seconds went by and the silence became louder. After about 30 seconds, people began to get uncomfortable. Then there became a little whisper thinking that I might have forgotten or I was having some kind of episode. And I stood there, looking, silent, waiting. And finally, after about a minute and a half, a hush fell over the entire congregation. It was complete quiet. It was still. I had had my ushers shut off the air conditioning system so that there would be no noise of a fan. And we sat there in abject silence for 30 seconds. And then I began. That was indelibly etched on the minds of so many people because that silence was something that they realized that they had become completely uncomfortable with. They weren't used to it. It was as if I had forgotten something or I didn't know where I was and they became uncomfortable in the silence. There are symptoms of a fear of silence. Excessive noise can be debilitating and can bring on headaches. However, it's silence that can cause various symptoms in the sedatophobe. When the power goes out, that can be especially trying to such people since they're left without technology, noise, music, or movies around to comfort them. When left in silence, this person who's afraid of silence might have a panic attack, which may be characterized by the following symptoms. And you have to ask yourself if you suffer with this. Shivering, shaking, trembling, having dry mouth and sweaty palms, the inability to speak or express yourself, feeling detached from reality and having thoughts of death or dying, feeling numb, feeling like crying or fleeing, experiencing a rapid heartbeat, nausea, stomach distress. Sometimes a person with sedatophobia can also feel afraid in a group when people stop talking or there's a lull in the conversation. Sometimes taking a test can be especially hard for these people. Spending time in a library or even trying to sleep alone can be a scary time for the sufferers of this fear of silence. There are treatments. Prayer, of course, is the number one recommended treatment. Family members can help in this. Talking about the fear to a loved one can provide relief to some. Professional help is certainly recommended to talk to a pastor or a counselor about this. But when we are free from outside noise or turbulence, we are able to hear the still small voice of God's Spirit as He comes to comfort us and guide us, especially through our trials. Some of the noise we experience that could be blocking our ability to feel God's presence is our own worry. When we learn to change our thoughts from negative to positive, we are more able to feel God's love because we're in perfect harmony with Him, for He is the God of love. There is nothing negative about God. And when we rest in Him, when we are still, the noise and turbulence is replaced by a sweet peace. We experience calm, a period or condition of freedom from the storms, a state of tranquility. To be calm does not mean that the storm is no longer all around us. It means the storm is no longer within you. The storms may still rage around you, but you're free from the effects of them. They no longer trouble you because you know in whom you have trusted. You're in a place where you no longer fear. Oftentimes we see this outward symptom or symbol of putting our finger to our lips and telling people to hush. Our children, shh. It means to put at rest, to soothe. Oftentimes when trials come, we tend to get angry with God and cry out and complaint. When we do this, we lessen our ability to feel His Spirit because we leave no room for it in our hearts for the Spirit to dwell. God cannot dwell in a heart that's full of anger. It's when we learn to put at rest our complaints and cast our burdens on the Lord to hush our cries and wait upon him that will find solace. 
It says he came to bind up the brokenhearted and set the captive free. He also said he did not come to bring peace, but to be a sword to divide. But those who are on the side of accepting the Lord have that peace that passes all understanding. How does that manifest in our lives? We become untroubled by conflict. We become devoid of violence or force. Sometimes when difficulties arise, we allow the anger and frustration from those trials to push us into violence or we try to force our will upon the Lord. Neither one of these choices will bring us peace. When conflicts come and we're troubled by them because of our faith in God, only then can we know peace. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. And when we grab tightly hold of those problems and those things that trouble us, God will not wrestle it out of our hands, but he'll wait for us to release it. We find that when we clench our fingers after a long time of doing that, we no longer can feel. We lose a sensation. We cut off the blood circulation. God wants us to release it into his hands. He wants us to be serenely free of interruption or disturbance. We can learn to be still as we pray, as we read scripture, as we go for a walk or meditate on his words. We can learn to give ourselves time to ponder free from interruption and disturbance. This is what allows us to communicate with our Heavenly Father. It allows our Heavenly Father to communicate with us. This is what prayer is about. It's a two-way communication with God. We become much more restful by being at rest, by resting in Him. Oftentimes the busyness of life makes it impossible for us to truly hear what God is trying to tell us. But when we slow down and allow ourselves the opportunity to rest, then our mind and hearts can focus on those things that are of the greatest importance. God wants to talk to us, but we have to be ready and available to listen. Our thoughts are scattered. We have a natural inclination to look at what's wrong as opposed to what's right. We walk into a room and we see that picture that's at an angle. We see that something that's out of place. And our minds are distracted by all of the things around us. But we must find a serenity in God. We know that the sun does not rise and the sun does not set it's really an illusion the sun stays still steady and bright and the earth turns to face the sun that's when morning comes the darkness of the night comes when the earth turns away it's the same with us in our trials when we turn to face the sun the s-o-n who is steady and bright just like the earth we're filled with light if instead we choose to turn away from him the darkness of night will consume us we have to make a choice, a conscious choice, that even in our times of difficulty to turn to that light. We must become gentle and easygoing. God has given us truly a quiet nature when we are at one with him, but when we are not with him, we find it so much more difficult. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman and he gently persuades us to love him and serve others. We're more able to ease our own troubles and carry out God's Spirit within us when we are assisting others. I find that when people are troubled by their own lives, I strongly encourage them to volunteer somewhere, to take their mind off their own troubles and serve another. When we approach life and our trials in a calm manner, we're more able to see the bigger picture and outline a plan of recovery. Not only does it allow us to have a clear mind, but it allows us to keep calm the fears of those around us. We must find a certain tranquility of being of one mind with the Lord, one spirit with the Lord. When our mind and spirit are still, our whole body is at peace. We're able to see things with a clear mind, feel things with a pure heart, and hear the voice of our Heavenly Father with ears that are open and in tune with His Spirit. Yes, we will know God because we'll be one with him. Be still and know that I am God is not just a saying, it's a state of being. It's not just a passage of scripture, it's an instruction, a command. 
It's the ability to know God well enough to trust in his abilities to rescue us, to solve our problems. And as we learn to be still and trust in God, we come to know and understand that we are God's children. We're never alone. We're never unaided, never forgotten. He will come to us, and all it takes is for us to be still. And when you truly think about it, there is nothing that's really silent, for God speaks to us in all kinds of ways. If we go outside in the still of the night, we'll hear the rustling of the leaves. We'll hear night sounds. When we tune our ears, we hear crickets. The sounds of life happening around us and God speaking to us. But are we really ready to listen? Hearing God's voice is something we all long for, but it's really not that hard to do. In fact, God wants you to hear his voice. He doesn't speak to us through vibes or mediums. Hearing the voice of God is as natural as hearing your best friend talk to you. We can hear him every day and not just on special occasions or by long-winded prayers. He speaks to us in the natural moments of our lives. But the question is, do you really want to hear? Do you really want to hear God's voice? You say you want to hear him, but you have to be ready to listen. You have to ask yourself, why do you want to hear God's voice? But motives are important. The Bible says this about God's word, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart, Hebrews 4 and 12. What are the attitudes of our heart? Do we ask out of selfishness or vain desire, or do we ask of the Lord because we want guidance, wisdom, counsel, comfort? If you really want to hear God's voice, it's possible you're actually hearing him already. For he may want be the one giving you the longing to hear him. He puts that desire in your heart. In his book, Knowing God, J.I. Packer says that God has spoken to man and the Bible is his word given to us to make us wise unto salvation. The Bible itself declares in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God from John 1 and 1. In another place we read all scripture as God breathed and is useful for teaching rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness from 2 Timothy 3.16. You may hear people say that the Bible is just a book written by men, but the Bible itself claims to be God's word. Can we rely on it? The evidence of history, archaeology, fulfilled prophecy, and personal testimony of thousands of years is overwhelming proof that the Bible is indeed God's word. The simplest way to hear God's word is to read his word. To hear his voice is through his word. Find a good daily reading plan and stick to it. I found that listening to God's word was incredibly comforting and pierced through all the chatter around me. By having earbuds in, I could block out the world and hear clearly God's voice through his word. We hear God's word th his voice through prayer. You know, when you want to have a conversation with somebody, how do you begin? Do you just stand there in front of that person and hope they will talk to you? That would be kind of odd to just walk up in front of somebody and just stand there. But we usually begin a conversation by opening our own mouths and talking, engaging that person's attention by saying hello or calling them by name. It's the same with God. He loves to hear us talk to him, and it's in those moments that we prepare ourselves to hear the voice of God. Prayer is like saying, hello, God, it's me. I believe you created me and that you know way more about how I should live my life than I do. I'd like to get to know you better. Here's what's going on in my life, and I'd sure like your thoughts on how to handle it. Would you please speak to me today about this? If we have a comfortable conversation with God. Just like we talk to somebody else, we also listen for the response of the other person. It's the same with God. Once we've prepared our hearts to listen through prayer, prayer, we're more likely to hear the voice of God. 
does he speak to us through an audible voice? Sometimes he does, but usually that's not the case. We may not actually hear the voice of God, but he speaks to us in many ways. He speaks to us through his word. He does speak to us through our thoughts if we have the mind of Messiah. Oftentimes I pray that I will ask the Lord to bind his mind to my mind, to bind his spirit to my spirit, to bind his thoughts to my thoughts. God speaks through our thoughts. He speaks through our conversation with others. He speaks through our circumstances. He speaks through the Messiah. He tells us that Yeshua was God in the flesh. And for those scientific minded viewers who think that this is not possible, we must look at the forensic evidence of God who created us in his image. We are two parts invisible, one part visible. You cannot see my spirit, you cannot see my soul, but you can see my flesh. If we are created in the image of God, then God too must be two parts invisible, one part visible. We cannot look upon the Father, we cannot see the Holy Spirit, but we can see the Son in the flesh. So if you want to hear the voice of God, you must study and know the teachings of the Messiah. Here's how John described him, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life, from 1 John 1 and 1. It requires a personal relationship. We cannot really have an in-depth conversation with a total stranger. Imagine that, walking up to somebody you don't know and starting into a very long, detailed discussion with them. They would look upon you as if they don't know you because they don't know you. We don't want to come to God as a stranger. We want to have fellowship with God. Shortly before Messiah was crucified, he met with his disciples to reassure them of what would happen after he was gone. And he promised them a helper. He said, now we'll ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. From John 14, 16 and 17. The Holy Spirit then is the fulfillment of the way we hear God's voice. It is through the voice of the Holy Spirit, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you from John 14, 26. The second chapter of Acts describes the events that occurred on the day of Pentecost, Shavuot, 50 days after Messiah ascended into heaven. Verse 3 says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, the counselor promised by Jesus. This unique aspect of God's personality did not come to them as someone they could see and touch, but rather he came to live inside of them. That same spirit is available to you and me today. If you're a believer, then you already have the Holy Spirit available to you. And you should ask God for a fresh infilling every day, <clears throat> and he will prepare your heart to hear his voice. His spirit, that still small voice inside of you, is the one who will remind you of what God said and help you recognize God's opportunities in your life. We have the Bible. We have prayer. We have the Messiah. We have the Holy Spirit in our own hearts to help us in hearing God's voice. Do you really want to hear God's voice? That really is the ultimate question. For God responds to willing hearts. In the book of Revelation, we read, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me, from Revelation 3.20. God will never force you to obey him. But wait for your willing response to his call. Are you hearing his voice right now? If you are not hearing his voice, then ask. Set aside time to be with the Lord. Be intentional. Have quiet time before him. It's often said that the morning is the best time. 
early before the rest of the family wakes up. Maybe on a walk. Each morning I get up quite early and Ragsby, my little 12 pound terrier, go for a walk. We walk about a mile and a half and during that time the deer are out grazing. And we stop and even Ragsby fighting her own natural inclination to bark and to chase after will sit quietly with me as we watch the deer. They stop for a moment and they look at us to see if we're going to move or bring them harm. And when we're still long enough, they find the comfort. They realize that we're not a threat. And they go about grazing and walking along, five or six of them at a time in and out of the woods going after those tender shoots and those low hanging leaves. We stay about 25 yards away from them and we watch quietly. And they are majestic and they are beautiful and they are God's creation and he speaks through his creation. He speaks through the things of the natural, incredible and marvelous supernatural truths. Oftentimes the moon is quite bright. I can still see the stars. And from where I live, I can see out through the wood, woods over the city. And I can see the weather come in. I can look at the twilight, the early morning sky. I can watch the sun come up as we turn towards the light. And I can hear God's voice in the whisper and the quiet. And Ragsby, my little dog, is still. She is at one with me and I am at one with the Lord. We walk quietly along. We will see squirrels and we will see cats. <clears throat> we may even see other dogs out. But yet in that morning walk, she doesn't chase after them or growl or bark. It's in the afternoon walk that she does that. But in the quiet, she even recognizes what's going on around her. This is how we must be. We must take an attitude of intentional listening, of being still before the Lord, of raising up our petition to God, this is my time to speak to God, sometimes out loud, sometimes through my thoughts, as I pray quietly for those that I care for, for the needs of others, for our government, for Israel, for my family, for myself, for this ministry, for Jason, for his family, for those whose lives we touch through this ministry, I lift them up and ask God for his anointing, that anointing that will break every yoke, that the words that I speak would be edifying and glorifying to him. These are my prayers. And I pray for spiritual protection and for God appointments divine appointments in my life and the lives of others that there would be breakthrough that there would be transformation that people would come to faith by hearing about the power of the one true God the God of Israel the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob the one who sent his only begotten son for those that cannot conceive of this sacrifice we look at the story of Abraham and Isaac and that sets the tone for what God himself is willing to do Abraham knew of the promises of God and he hid them in his heart and this is where God wants us to hide his promises in our heart that the word says to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and then all this other stuff will be given unto you we're commanded not to worry not to walk in fear, to be strong, but yet we cower at trouble. We look for solutions in the natural. 
And God wants us on our knees, humbled before him, petitioning the throne of grace through the Messiah to ask for what it is that we need, and God is faithful. It may come in an instant. It may come over time. You may not even realize that your prayers are being answered, and you may also realize or not realize that you were prayed into the kingdom by somebody long ago that prayed for you. They were talking to God about you long before you even realized it. I remember in elementary school, my phys ed teacher, Cyril Pittman, used to call me Nicodemus. I had no idea what it meant at the time. But yet, as I came to faith and I read the New Covenant Scriptures, I read of Nicodemus, a rabbi who asked the question, how can I inherit the kingdom of heaven? This was a question that I asked. And so at seven, eight, and nine years old, this prophetic name was given to me by somebody that was just a gym teacher, but yet, clearly, it was a prayerful statement that he cared enough about the kids to call one of them Obadiah to call me Nicodemus. It was a prayerful statement, one he believed would come to pass. I want to encourage you that in that still quiet that you may have trouble with, that you embrace it, that you find in that stillness and in that quiet the comforting voice of the Lord through psalms, through prayers, through his word, maybe through a worship song, the poetry of the Bible, through a conversation with a friend, through a family member, through a pastor and his sermon, through a Bible study, or simply just through conversation with God. We know that God spoke to Moses as a friend. And this is the pattern that we have friendship and fellowship with God because he wants to have fellowship with us. These are the instructions he gives to us. Be still and know that he is God. Do you want to hear his voice right now? Say yes. And if you don't know the Messiah, Say yes to him. Repent for your sins. Ask for forgiveness. Believe in the one who died for you. And he is faithful to forgive you your sins. And then you will begin your relationship with God. We'll be right back. 